Well, hello there. It's another episode of the Talk To Me podcast. My name is Michelangelo Caruso. I'm your host, and my friend Roger Crawford is with me today. Hi, Roger. Hi, Michael. How are you? Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, man. I'm sorry it's taken us so long to get this together. We met um, many, many months ago, but I think it was this year in it San Jose, California, when you gave a talk. I, in fact, we were both speaking, but right. I... I feel like I met you. I don't care if you met me. I met you, and that, that was a big day for me. I'm a big fan of yours. Before Thank we get you. started with the questions, I want to remind our listeners that if they're watching on YouTube, they can catch the audio version of any of these podcasts on iTunes, Podbean, any of the major platforms. And if you're listening out there in TV land, you're listening on the wrong device. You should be watching us on the YouTube channel, Michael Angelo Caruso on YouTube. Roger, I get to see a lot of speakers uh, because I'm a speaker, and most of these events have multiple speakers at them. And I, I was so impressed with you, and I, I don't mean to fawn, but uh, there are a lot of average speakers out there. In fact, statistically right. speaking, most of us are average, which is why I was so delighted to see you do your thing. You're, you're so polished and professional. Do you have training in this or is it something you learned through the years? Well, Michael, I think that uh, a lot of it comes from stage time. I've been speaking over a number of years. I've actually, um, I started off speaking in schools and, and I've always said to young speakers that if you want to learn how to deliver a presentation, stand in front of a high school audience Friday afternoon, last period of the day, you learn how to speak really quickly. <laughs> so I've spent a lot of time speaking. I've also spent a lot of time studying the craft of speaking and want to make sure that when I'm up there, I'm giving the audience the best of me. And we talked earlier uh, about the importance of building the bridge with the audience, because the speech is not about me. It's about them. Yeah. And how can I add value to their lives and to their work? So I think about that. I appreciate the compliment uh, about speaking. It's something that for me, um, I take the art of speaking very seriously. And I, um, and we can talk a little bit about how I do that and um, and so forth. Yeah, you know, I'll just tell you that um, uh, for the people watching, you'll probably notice that I have a physical challenge. It affects show, all four of my... Show us so we know. Yeah, so both my hands and then uh, both my legs as well. I have an artificial left leg and a partial right uh, foot. So Tom See, that's born. interesting. I, and you may have said that during the speech, but uh, because that's what I, I can see your hands all the time. I focused right. on your hands. And it could be that the legs was a bigger problem. I don't even know. Right. The, well... You know, I was fortunate growing up. I had really great parents and who were very encouraging. They really empowered me. And I think yeah. one of the most important messages that I heard growing up was this. Everybody faces challenges. Yours is just visible. Okay, and good. what that did for me, Michael, was it was a mindset shift to where I felt much less of a victim. And I felt much more in control of my life because all of a sudden I wasn't necessarily different, right? I just was challenged like everyone else. Right. And I said this in my speech, and I, I, I believe this wholeheartedly, and I think that it applies to every area of our life and really any profession or business, is the fastest way to increase results is decrease excuses, and the truth is that often the excuses that we have for ourselves, they're self-imposed. Oh, yeah. Um, because for me, growing up, I had a father that insisted that I was not going to feel sorry for myself. Excuse me, Roger, remind me, your situation is congenital? It is, yeah, congenital. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, uh, and it, it has a genetic component to it interestingly enough, but um, I have children and they have not not inherited it. But um, uh, there is some genetic component to it. Uh, nobody in my family has it. This is just what 
geneticists that have kind of studied my case or studied this syndrome, which is called ectrodactyly, says that um, you know there is some some genetic component. But 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 um, I'm sorry, you know, back, to your, was, back to your father. No, 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 it's fine. But but it was fortunate just growing up that I had that messaging, right? Just no excuses. And yeah. so what it did was it 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 removed a lot of barriers for me. You know, I, I could do it. It was whether, you know, I had the determination to do it. Did I have the adaptability to do it? Uh, and for me, uh, I love sports. And I gravitated to the sport of tennis. And people often wonder, Roger, how well do you play tennis? Well, uh, you know, I had the opportunity of hitting some tennis balls with Serena Williams and that taught me a positive attitude doesn't work every time. But I played Division I college tennis at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. And if I could just distill it down, like how was it that a guy with one leg, three fingers, and half a foot played Division I college tennis? It really would be this. I learned the power of consistency. Get the ball over the net one more time than the other person, you win the point. Now, here's why I think that's valuable. Perfection is rarely attainable, but we can always be consistent. Now, there's a saying on the tennis court. I used to use this with my players when I was coaching, and I think it's a compelling thought. It's better to be consistently good than occasionally great. Yeah. Well done. Because just if we use tennis as an example, boy, there's some flashy players out there and man, they can hit a, just this amazing winner, but then they miss five shots in a row. That's so true. Think about even that. In, yeah. In our life. Right. Well, and in speaking consistency, right. you, you, you could uh, deliver a, a presentation very, very well once. But if you can't do it over and over and over again, and even improve on that consistency, much like a tennis game, you're not going to get fresh gigs. You're not going to get rebooked. Um, you mentioned, Roger, that you studied. And speaking is an interesting game to get into because there is no formal studying. I, I guess you could get a degree in elocution or something. I don't really know how close you could get to this in college. How did you study speaking? Did you, do you have... Uh, I think you're an NSA guy. Maybe you've got some mentors that took you aside. Um, in my case, I'm just watching and learning all the time. I call that studying. You can always learn from somebody what not to do, and sometimes you're learning what to do, both. What's your version of this? Absolutely. So here is my bias. I study speakers and I learn from speakers. But I always come back to... I have to be the best version of myself. We've all seen speakers, presenters that have been what I'm going to call overcoached. Yeah. And the presentation is so orchestrated and so planned that it loses its authenticity. Uh, so when I talk about studying speaking, I remember Brian Tracy told me this one time. He said, every word you speak, you have to have five words in reserve. And I think that's a really, really excellent point because it really speaks to the depth of message. Is that to be prepared for what you're about to say next or because you're never going to use that reserve? It's just there for backup. Uh, I, how I, How I interpret it was... It's there to give you a level of confidence, oh. assuredness that you have a depth of message. Yeah. Uh, that one thing. And the second thing is that I spend quite a bit of time working on perfecting material. One of the best documentaries I've ever seen, I'd recommend it to any speaker, is Comedian. Have you ever seen it, Michael? No. Is it a, a study of stand up comedy? Right. And Jerry Seinfeld's in it. And they follow Jerry Seinfeld and other comics. They follow them for a number of months and you watch their technique of developing material. And here's what you find. Number one, 
is the way they're able to observe the world, okay, interpret the world, but then how they communicate it and every single word that they say, yeah, they yeah. scrutinize. Well, there is no fat on the bone of a bit. Comedians call them bits. And uh, what most people don't know is that the comedian doesn't tell a different version of the same joke the next night. He tells the exact same, exact same version. One. He might fool with a microsecond more delay or a quicker delivery or a hand thrust when he says it instead of not. But that's so true, man. These, these pieces are sculpted and crafted and refined and tested. That's what open mic's for. Open night, uh, exactly. open mic night, right on Monday night. It's so you test it with forty people before you put it in front of forty thousand on the HBO special. Right Good for you, man. And Brian Tracy and is I, no I, no slouch when you're when you're learning from uh, the best. Brian Tracy and I have been good friends for a number of years, and I will tell you that I admire him on a number of different levels, but not the least of which is that he really lives his message every day. I've seen it. And I, had, I, I just admire him. I saw immensely. him the first time when I was 26. He was the first professional speaker I ever saw. Wow. And I, I was taken by his confidence, his measured tone. When I say measured, mm -hmm. uh, he never gets too excited. He's not a theatrical kind of a speaker. Right. But he'll say things like, there is no better time to be a professional speaker. And then, and then I'll tell you three reasons why. I mean, he's all organized before it even comes out of his head. He's the guy who says there are three reasons why, and then he tells you the three reasons. I mean, most people can't even get organized to three before they start talking. Absolutely. I love that about him. I do too. And, you know, it's interesting as we're talking, Michael, um, something that I really believe about speaking is that there are a lot of people that have gotten into speaking and they have a great story. And I think that's wonderful. Yeah. I will tell you that. I think that your story must be the backdrop because the truth is, is audiences don't care that much about your story. They care a lot more about their story. Yeah, and that so hurts my feelings. You... <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, man. I tell people all the time, the speaker coaching and all that, I tell them they don't care about you. They care about themselves. You got to make your story about them. And the students, right. the clients, they're all like, oh, how do I do that? Well, you tell your story, but there's a turn that happens in it where they go, oh, my God, he's talking about me. And you mentioned earlier, maybe before we press record, the mechanism for that is the human condition, because it does start right. out, I think, as a personal narrative in first person. Absolutely. And then uh, let's say it's an airplane story. Well, it's a story by the time you took a trip on an airplane and something happened. But before you know it, they're thinking about themselves getting on an airplane. Many of them flew on an airplane to get to that conference. They have to get on a plane to go home. And they go, oh, this could happen to me. Uh, you know, Dave Sanderson. Yeah. Uh, everybody, he's the guy that uh, was the last person off the plane that uh, ditched into the Hudson River. It's called the movie was right. Miracle on the Hudson with Tom Hanks. And when Sanderson tells that story, you can't stop thinking about what would you do in that situation? The plane lands right. on the water. And, and he's, he's remarkable at not only telling the story, but getting you to think about yourself. And it's, of course, it's a motivational story at, at its core. Be a better person. Think of other people before you act to uh, serve yourself. That was kind of his motto as he was getting off the plane. There's somebody that needs right. help before I do. Yeah, it's a brilliant, it's a, a brilliant example of how somebody can take, you know, their experience and make it the audience's experience. You know, you know, I, I, uh, I didn't tell the story when you heard me, but um, story that I do tell with certain audiences is I, I talk about being a young boy and being asked to do handprints in school. I'm sorry, hand handprints. Like this? You know how you used to do hand prints? Like, like in cement or some sort of plaster no, no, no. of Paris? Yeah, that's okay. So it would be like a piece of paper and you'd take it home for your oh, parents. Like so that the yeah, hand yeah. prints, yeah, okay. yeah. So I talk about that and I talk about the teacher 
that insisted that I do the hand press. And then I talk about physically doing the hand prints. And then I talk about bringing it home to my parents. And I say they put it in the most prestigious art gallery in the world, the Crawford Refrigerator. <laughs> okay. So there's the, now there's kind of a distilled version of the story. But what's the point? The point is refrigerator moments. Okay. What are those refrigerator moments in your life? What have been those times that you felt victorious? You felt accepted. You felt empowered. Yeah. Let's go back and relive those. Yeah. Let's unpack yeah. those. And let's use those as inspiration for our future. Because isn't this true for you, Michael? I know for me that when I'm discouraged, I realize that I'm forgetting what I probably should remember. And I'm remembering what I probably should forget. Yeah, nice. And I think that's so true for all of us. But there's an example of how, you know, because look, the audience is not going to relate to having three fingers, one leg and half a foot, but they are going to relate to fear. They are going to relate to insecurity. They're, they're, they all desire inspiration. They want hope, right? Right. They want to foster self-belief. So how do you do, I mean, so those should be the objectives. I can add to the I list. Think. That's my opinion. I can add to the list. And, and of course, there'll always be a good barstool argument about, you know, one's more important than another. I think most people want more confidence. Yep. I think most people want to look younger or feel younger. Yep. Everybody wants to be healthy, although they don't, sometimes their actions belie that. Even the smokers outside, you know, I, came out for some fresh air. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Right. Um, I do a lot of sales coaching and I think you do too, yeah? Uh-huh, I or do. sales training, sometimes it's called. Um, I always tell people, sell what people want, not necessarily what you have. Yeah. There's the old adage about the car salesman who, uh, as soon as the, the, the uh, the, the the couple comes in they say well the number one thing is comfort we're tired of this car it's cramped i'm a really tall guy the seats don't move the way i want them to move he mentions five or six things we have a cottage up north it's a four-hour drive when i get out i'm like an accordion i need a day and a half just to decompress from my car and then the salesperson proceeds to ignore that comfort was the number one thing he wanted to buy and tries to right. sell him what he's going to get a commission on or the oldest right. car on the lot, you know, sell what people want. And same thing as a motivational speaker. You got to find out what the audience wants. Um, you said you do interviews of people in advance to get to know them. Tell us about I the do. Uh, methods you have for that. So if I'm speaking to a group, like I recently had a presentation for an insurance company. And so what I do is I, I interview some of the leaders of the group. But then I'll interview people that are going to be in the audience. And here's why. I want to take their story and I want to make them the hero. Yeah. Okay. I want to be able to speak their language. Uh, and what I mean by that, there's terminology that certain companies use that are germane to that company. You want to make sure you incorporate that into your talk. For example, what do they call their fellow employees? Do they call them team members? Do they call them associates? What, how do they, what are some of their sometimes, acronyms? That sometimes the name is worse than that. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Well said. Um, and to, to incorporate that into, into your presentation. Also to be able to, to say uh, something like this, that, you know, in talking with, with Joanne, she said that what keeps her up at night is this. Yeah. Or her greatest struggle is this. Or her key to success is this. And then I use that, okay, as a platform for some material about that. Yes. And then yes. I'll, I'll refer back to what they told me because they're the experts. I'm not the expert in their business. They are. I'm That's just a, there to add value. Yeah. And I saw you do, uh, you were continuing to test and interview from the stage. 
uh, call and response. I was talking with Joanne before the program a couple of weeks ago, we talked by phone and she said what keeps her up at night is such and such. Do any of you other people have that same issue? And then you can get this large, big ass response. And now you know you can right. drill down on this. Or if you get like a little smattering of hands, you're like, we're going to be moving along pretty quickly after I dispense of this Joanne advice. Exactly. All of it is getting to know the audience, which I think in the, the, the big speaker Bible in the sky, know your audience is the number one rule. And I, and I, I, I get back to the word authenticity. Mm. And, you know, people talk a lot about authenticity, but oftentimes they're not exactly sure what that means. And for me, okay, authenticity means that I'm going to give them the best that I have to offer, number one. Number two is I'm going to share it with my truth. I'll, I'll never forget, I was on a program with a speaker, and this person was very accomplished. And the person told their story, and it was like a rocket ship. It was like with determination and motivation and so forth, I went from here to the mountaintop. Yeah. And I sat there, and for me, it fell flat. Oh, And it fell flat because I thought, eh, that's not the real story. Because nobody does it alone. Nobody does it without struggle. Nobody does it without insecurity. So tell me about that, because I can learn from that. It wasn't believable. It wasn't believable. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, that's like the first uh, step to authenticity, right? It's got to be believable. It has to be believable, and it has to be something in your core that really is is your truth. Yeah. Um, because if I stood up there and I said, for example, you know what, I got three fingers and one leg, half a foot, it really hadn't bugged me. I really don't think about it. You know, I really don't. Ain't no but thing. if you remember what I said, what I said in my speeches, every single day I'm reminded of it. Every day. Every day. I walk out in public, every day I'm reminded of it. So now I got a choice. Like I got a choice. So when people look at me twice, Okay, how am I internalizing that? Well, when I was younger, I saw it as rejection. Hmm. Now I see it as curiosity. Big difference. Big difference. I can handle curiosity. Rejection is like I'd like to get us to the compassion, the compassion stage. Yeah. You know, because curiosity, well, curiosity reminds me of oddity or isn't that unusual i'd like to get to a place where and i feel this sometimes not all the time i'm trying to get there myself i'll see somebody in a wheelchair like a kid or anybody yeah. really sure and instead of wondering what's wrong with what's wrong with them or how terrible their life must be i just smile and say hello and you know i, I i'm always taken by the fact they even get out of the house a lot of them right Right. Because it would be so easy just to turtle and, and never get out, never do anything with their lives. And here they are making something of it. And, and that pulls at my heartstrings. I'd like to get yeah. all of us to that stage with, uh, with you and anybody who's got issues. And to, further to the point, you said something magical a minute ago. You said a lot of uh, people who are disabled, you just can't, you can't see what's wrong with them. That's right. So that means we just got to treat everybody with compassion. Wouldn't that be just great? Here's the great news, my friend, is that we have come such a long way. Yes. Now here, what I'm going to say next is probably, especially for younger people that are listening, this is probably going to shock them. They're going to say, this, this couldn't be. I was born in 1960. Mm. I went to first grade in 1965. In 1965, children that had physical disabilities were not mainstreamed they were not what mainstreamed oh they weren't mainstreamed in a classroom with with able-bodied students just didn't happen was that it was starting of, to happen but my point of... was it wasn't it was and now you think my gosh look how the world's changed so i'm super hopeful i mean i think we've evolved a long way i really do i mean i've seen it in my lifetime and I, I, I think for me, like, I, I'm always sensitive to the fact that I'm a speaker that happens to have a physical challenge and not a physically challenged speaker. 
because I want to be able to look in the mirror and say, you know what, if I did not have this story, I could still be a speaker. That'd be good. Maybe a di different venue, different message. And that's important to me because I, I wanted to, to compete on the athletic field and business or whatever with able-bodied folks. I didn't want to give myself a pass. And I'm, I'm, I'm very adamant about this. It, my wife, my wife always laughs about it. You know, like I refuse, refuse to park in a handicapped spot. Oh, I won't do it. I don't need it. I don't need it. I walk fine on my artificial leg. I don't need it. So, and I'm not judging people that do. Please don't misunderstand. I, this, I'm just talking about me, right? Yeah. It's a mindset. I mentioned before we press record, I have a, a coaching a client right now who is blind. She's a terrific person. Carrie Ann is her name. She lives in Barbados. And one of the first things she told me when she was deciding to get into the course, she said, this will resonate with you, I think. She said, um, when people find out I'm disabled, they expect less of me. And she does not like that. It's a right. form of pigeonholing that she finds insulting, insufferable, she wants to prove them wrong almost instantly. Right. Uh, and I can see the argument, you know, uh, just because you're, you're physically disabled cannot, uh, does not keep you from being an elite speaker. And I'll double stamp that you are an elite speaker. Didn't, after a while, because you had such great work on stage, it was almost like art, what you were doing. I actually came to forget you were disabled. Right, I which stopped. is which is music to my ears. <laughs> I stopped looking at your hands, brother. And I started yeah. looking at your face and listening more carefully to what you were saying. And, and there was like this conversion as I, you know, uh, yeah, you're also an That's accomplished great. author. You've got three books out. All I do. Available I do. And, uh, more information. Yeah, at on Crawford. Amazon or yeah. And more info at rogercrawford.com, but available yeah, on it's Amazon. rogercrawford.com. That's right. And, uh, uh, would you tell us the title of the three books? Yeah, so I, I have a book called Think to Win, which is a book on possibility thinking. Mm -hmm. um, I have a book called Challenges Are Inevitable, which is my autobiography, and a book called How High Can You Bounce, which is uh, about resiliency. It's about not only how to bounce back, but how to bounce back better. Good. Because I think like that... one of those uh, Super Bowls. Exactly. Bounces higher Bouncing than back better. the first time. Exactly. Well, exactly. Great. Well, um, I have not had the pleasure, but I'm going to look you up and, uh, and start getting going on my Roger Crawford library. Thanks, Michael. I appreciate that. Let's play a little game of best gig, worst gig before we go. Okay. I like to do this with my speaker buddies because we all have, you know, tales from the road. Um, and all you speakers out there will find this educational because it's not all glory and glitz, ladies and gentlemen. A lot of it is hard work in bad hotels. Uh, often uh, sick. If you get sick a lot, you're sick all the time on the road because it's even harder to stay healthy out there. For sure. But we have had some uh, had some good news gigs as well. What's been your favorite gig? Is that an easy question? Well, my favorite gig. There's so many of them. Um, I had the opportunity of speaking in front of 46,000 people, which was amazing, uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Which what was, was the nature uh, of this? It was an Amway convention, and it was at a huge football stadium. That was really a, a cool gig. Um, I've had so many. Honestly, I really appreciate every single one. Yeah. Um, and you know, that would be just one that stuck out memorable. I spoke at the Australian Open Tennis uh, Championships, which was at the International Tennis Coaches Conference, where I got to interact with a lot of my heroes. That was a really important one. Um, you know, when you think about the worst gig, um, you know, there's been a few that that maybe that the 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 setup wasn't what was needed for optimum performance. Um, I, I twice I've had someone pass away in my audience. And one in Roger, one in Boston. Roger, never Roger. Forget, when twice. we say when we say you really killed them today, that's not what we yeah. mean, man. Yeah, no, no, and that was um, one in particular I'd never forget. I, I 
it was a big group. It's about 2000 people and person like the third row dropped over and you could tell he was really in distress and they were giving him CPR and, and they brought the paramedics in and we had to stop and, and, and so forth. And then, you know, I thought a lot about him and his family and, and so was forth. It a and heart attack? Heart attack. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's strictly a coincidence, uh, you know, timing. He could have had it at breakfast. He could have right. had it in the shower. Just happened to have it during your program. Right. But I would say the vast majority of them have just been great. You know, but we, you know, you have to, when you're on the stage, you got to, you got to realize that the unexpected can happen. I mean, you know, you can have, you know, a brass band next door. I've had that, you know, I've had the mic go off. You it's know, never, mic just stopped working. We've had a, it all. We, it's never a flute convention. It's always a brass band. Why is that? Isn't that the truth? Yeah. <laughs> I was, uh, let's leave it on a positive note, even as we talk about bad gigs. Uh, my motto is that something good always happens, even at the worst gigs. Yeah. A uh, quick story you'll enjoy because just stories from the road. I, I was, uh, I came up through public seminars. Do you remember um, skill path and national seminars and career track? Yeah. It's the hardest sure. you could work in the business, but it's a great book oh, for learning. For sure. No doubt. And they always booked us to fly at, you know, 11 p.m. to come home and you had to be at the airport at 6 a.m. because they want to save money on flights. And the hotels were not exactly top rate either. So I'm, I'm in my uh, crappy hotel, off-brand hotel always. And um, I was exercising in my room because they didn't even have a, a gym in the thing. It was that shabby. <clears throat> and I'm doing uh, crunches. And as I come down and come back up again, a mouse scurries across the floor where I'm laying, which got my attention. I went to the room and there's water dripping from the ceiling because it had rained the night before. And we had expected something like 50 people and only 20 were there because of the crappy weather or whatever. And I thought, I got to get out of this business. I deserve better than this. And I'm tired of these shabby hotels and, the, and getting treated poorly and the less than appreciative audiences. And that day, Roger, there was a lady in the audience. The gig was in Kansas City, Missouri. And there was a lady in the audience who worked at Hallmark. And she liked me. And Hallmark Corporation hired me for a gig sometime later. Wow. You never know what's happening. And that's why Absolutely. as speakers, we need, to, we need to give people our very best at every gig, no matter every what time. position, no matter how we feel. Every time. Yeah, no doubt. And uh, yeah, for sure. For sure. And it just made me think about the importance of just being up on your feet and speaking. Just you, you just have to put in those reps. There's just no substitute for it. I mean, I cringe when, you know, look on the internet and you'll see these advertisements say, you know, in 90 days, you know, you're going to be a professional speaker. I don't I cringe because I, it's just not possible. Or make you know, that it, amount of money. Yeah. It's just not possible. It, it's not an easy business. And for anybody who's going to tell you that it is easy, they haven't done it. Because I, this is my 38th year full time speaking, 38 years, yeah. And um, it's not an easy business for a variety of reasons that you discussed, changing. the, the travel, being changing. sick, all that, you know. Oh my gosh, changed a lot. Audiences have changed a lot. I mean, I'm now talking to meeting planners that are, that are my kids' age. It's a big change, right? And I was talking to a speaker the other day who's been in the business a long time. Person, very nice, good friend, feeling a little discouraged and was complaining about the current environment for speakers. Hmm. And I said to him, and I really believe this, and I reflected back on my own life experience to say this is, don't spend that energy complaining about what is. Just don't, because it's because it's a waste of time. That's what it is. So the question is, how are you going to address what is? You know, it's kind of like in my life. You know, people say, "Do you ever re- do you realize do you have three fingers, or have you just forgotten about it?" And I start <laughs> cracking up. I'm like, "Are you kidding me?" You know. But no, it is, but it's a great business. And I, I really believe 
some people may disagree with this, but I think the only way to have longevity in the business is to really love what you do and love the audience. Yeah. Because you can't really do it for money. I mean, that's a big misconception because people think, oh, you know, uh, you're going to get X amount of dollars for one hour. And they don't see the prep time, the travel time, and all that that goes into it. Yeah. So I think it's a great business, but you got to love it. You got to love it. You got to love the audience. Truer words were never spoken. RogerCrawford.com, everybody. The guy's a master at what he does. Thank we'll you, check Michael. Out his Appreciate books, that, my especially friend. How high can you bounce? Yep. Uh, any big plans coming up? Something to look forward to, Roger? Well, I've got a I've got a, a fairly busy fall, and I'm taking a nice vacation with my wife. We're going to Portugal and Spain, which I'm looking forward to. And uh, no, life's good. Life's good. I've got uh, four grandchildren and uh, four great kids, and uh, life's pretty sweet. Congratulations, man, on all the success. You you earned it. You deserve it. I can't Thank wait you, to Michael. see you again. Thank you for being with us today. Thanks, Michael. Appreciate it. See you soon.